thank you all so much for coming. What an amazing audience. Well, I am extremely pleased to be here today to talk to you about my just published book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress, and the Road to Civil War, which tells the previously untold story of physical violence in the House and Senate chambers in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Now, in the many years that I've been working on this book, I've discovered that most Americans know about one violent incident in Congress. They don't always know the details. They don't always know any of the names. They certainly don't always know the dates. But whenever I tell people that I'm working on a book on physical violence in Congress, they tend to do this. It's a caning motion, and of course what they're referring to is the caning, the very famous caning of Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts, the abolitionist senator who was caned while seated at his desk in the Senate chamber. And the book's title is actually taken from a response to that caning. So not long after it took place, a friend of Sumner's wrote that blood would flow, somebody's blood, on that field of blood, the floor of Congress, I have fully expected. Now, as a historian, I will say that when you find a quote like that, you sing hosannas to the history gods because what an amazing quote, right? There's a person who says explicitly, physical violence in Congress wasn't a surprise. That writer expected it, and he literally called the floor of Congress the field of blood. Now clearly, when I began researching this book, I knew that this was a story that had not yet been told. And yet, there was a lot of violence on the House and Senate floors between 1830 and 1860. In fact, I found roughly 70 physically violent incidents in the pre-Civil War Congress. And by violent, I mean canings, shoving, fist fights, people pulling knives and guns on each other, dual negotiations, the occasional duel, although obviously that's not taking place in the House or the Senate, and the occasional wild melee, usually in the House with bunches of men rolling in the aisles, throwing punches, as well as a handful of street fights with fists, bricks, and the occasional umbrella. Now, I'll bet that many of you are thinking what I myself thought at the beginning of this project, which is, that's a pretty dramatic story, so why hasn't it been told before? I asked myself that question many times while researching my book, and there's a good answer. Most of the violence was censored out of the period's equivalent of the congressional record. Now, there are clues in the record which you notice once you know the violence is there. So, for example, every now and again, the record states that a debate, quote, became unpleasantly personal at one point. <laughs> now that, that doesn't sound too snazzy when you read it without knowing the violence is there, right? It's like, oh, they called each other names, perhaps. But on one occasion, a congressman pulled a gun on another congressman, and that was an unpleasantly personal moment. Or the record will say something like, there was a sudden sensation in the corner of the house. In that particular case, one congressman began punching another congressman, and they flipped over their desk, and that was a sudden sensation in the corner of the house. Now, enormous brawls get mentioned, but usually in the absolute barest detail, as in the case of one huge fight in 1849 that was summed up by this wonderfully poetic phrase. I don't know who this particular reporter was, but in the congressional record, you see debate, 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 and then there's brackets, and it says within the brackets, the house is like a heaving billow kind of gives you an impression of what it must have been like at that particular moment. What you don't see is the kind of detail offered in this account of a house fight that I found in a diary, and I'm going to say a little bit more about this diary in a few minutes. So here's someone who's actually in the House of Representatives watching one of these incidents unfold. The speaker cried at the extent of his voice, order, 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 Exclamations from the crowd of, damn him, down with him, where are your bowie knives? Order, gentlemen, for God's sake, come to order. Go it, Arnold, knock him down. Okay, <laughs> that's not in the record, right? That sort of description is not in the record. Why? Well, in part, it has to do with the nature of the Washington press in this period. In the 1830s, 
The Washington press consisted of a handful of men, and at that point they were all men, working for a handful of local Washington newspapers. And these men sat in the House and the Senate, they scribbled notes, they checked their notes with the congressman who had been speaking, and then published their accounts, not only in newspapers, but in spin-off publications that essentially acted as a congressional record. The newspapers that these reporters worked for were unquestionably and unapologetically partisan. So objective news was not a goal at this point at all. So as a reporter, it was in your interest to make your party's congressman look good. It was also in your interest as a reporter to make congressmen look good because Congress granted government printing contracts and many a newspaper relied on those contracts for survival. Plus, on the sort of level of brass tacks, unhappy congressmen occasionally slugged the reporter who made them unhappy. So <laughs> for reasons of personal preservation, you also did not want to make congressmen unhappy. So the Washington press had many reasons to smooth over the rough edges of what happened in Congress, which means that although the Washington press played up the bravado of many congressmen, they left most of the violent details out. So why hasn't the story of congressional violence been told? Well, in part because it's exceedingly hard to find. If you're not looking for it, if you don't know it's there, you probably won't see it. Now, given the censored congressional record, you're probably wondering how it is that I came to find 70 congressional fights. In fact, you might be wondering how I found the topic of congressional violence at all. And the absolute truth is, I stumbled across it. When I was first pondering my next book project to follow my first book, Affairs of Honor, I knew that I wanted to explore political violence. It's one of the things I focus on a lot. I knew I wanted to write about political culture. Uh, I thought that I wanted to work on the 19th century and not the 18th century, which I've been writing about before. And I knew that one congressman killed another in a duel in 1838. And that was pretty much what I knew. So I thought, OK, I don't know what I'm going to write about. But I'll look around in 1838. There's a moment of political violence on a high level in the national government that somehow or other maybe something will reveal itself to me and I'll have something to write about. I went to the private correspondence of a congressman from the same state as the man who'd been killed, and I began reading. Now, this particular congressman wrote to his wife almost every day. And I soon found that, oddly enough, his letters were filled with moments of violence or near violence. So people pushing up their sleeves to throw a punch or people actually throwing punches. At first, I, I thought, because it was so unexpected, I thought, is he possibly making this up somehow to entertain his wife? Although why that would be entertaining, I don't know. Uh, but in time, I just found too much violence in his letters. And so I began to keep track. And at that point, I began to turn to other congressmen's private letters, seeing if this was something that I could find more evidence of, or if I couldn't, what could it possibly mean? I spent three months researching in congressmen's papers at the Library of Congress. And in those three months, I never opened a congressman's private papers without finding at least one fight. So in the end, by digging in private correspondence and diaries, and then comparing my gleanings with the period's congressional record and with whatever I could uncover in congressional newspaper coverage, I found so much violence that I knew that this was gonna be my next book. I had to tell the story and I had to figure out what the story meant. And that process of digging and reconstructing is why it took me, and it actually did, take me 17 years to write this book. <laughs> I tell my students that my book is as old as they are, basically. <laughs> Um, but it took me a long time, and a lot of it was just uncovering and piecing together the incidents that make up the core of the book. Now, not surprisingly, when you look at the violence over the 30-year period at the heart of the book, you see patterns. So for one thing, you see the power of political bullying. Generally speaking, congressmen divided their ranks into two kinds of men. And these are their phrases. So a, a lot of times during this project, I would find something that was so striking or unbelievable, I would think people will not believe that this is true, which is why I keep saying, no, this is really what they called it. In this case, congressmen tended to divide their ranks into two kinds of men, quote, fighting men and quote, non-combatants. 
So at the beginning of a term, they would look around and say, you know, oh, well, he seems like a fighting man. Let's see what he does this term. So they were thinking in this way, in the terms of violence, even before a session started. Now, notably, most fighting men were Southerners or Southern-born Westerners. They were more likely to be armed. They were usually more willing to fight. And most Northerners were non-combatants, which means that generally speaking, for a long time, Southerners bullied Northerners in Congress, often to protect the institution of slavery. They insulted and threatened and sometimes assaulted Northerners to intimidate them into compliance or silence. And for a time, this strategy worked quite well. For a time, Southerners wielded an outsized influence on the floor of Congress and protected their slave regime in the process. So that in the same way that the three-fifths compromise meant that they had an advantage of numbers in Congress, they had a cultural advantage that gave them an outsized influence in Congress as well. Now for a time, in the 1830s and for part of the 1840s, much of the fighting was between men of different parties. So for the most part, Whigs were fighting Democrats and both parties had their share of fighting men, so the fighting seemed fair. But in the 1850s, things began to change, partly because of Western expansion and the rising problem of slavery on Western lands and what would happen to new states and would they be states that allowed slavery or would they be free states, National politics became increasingly polarized. The debate over slavery became more of a fight than a debate. And at the same time, a new form of technology, the telegraph, made matters worse by transmitting news around the nation with breakneck speed before politicians could spin the news as they saw fit. The end result was more violence in Congress, particularly given that the American public was increasingly cheering on their congressmen to fight for their rights. And this was true for Northerners as well as Southerners. As Northerners got a sense of the degree to which their representatives were being silenced, they began voting fighting men into Congress. The anti-slavery Republican Party came to power in the mid-1850s based on their promise to fight what they called the slave power. And that was their rhetoric, and that was their promise. We are the party that will fight the slave power. In Congress, working alongside Southerners, that had a real true meaning to it. And these Northern fighting men stayed true to their promise, fighting Southerners with resistance, with fists, and occasionally with weapons. Again and again during debate, Republicans would rise to their feet and insist they were a new kind of Northerner, a Northerner who had been sent to Congress to fight. And I want to offer you just a few paragraphs of the book that will give you a sense, I think, of, of what this meant to the men who were in Congress at this moment trying to stay true to that promise. It's one of the documents that um, I want to say stunned me and, and moved me uh, at the beginning of my working on this. Um, as you'll hear, it's, it's so immediate. Toward the start of my research, I discovered poignant testimony to the power of congressional threats and violence. It took the form of a confidential memorandum with three signatures on the bottom. Benjamin Franklin Wade, a Republican from Ohio, Zachariah Chandler, a Republican from Michigan, and Simon Cameron, a Republican from Pennsylvania. And it told a striking story. One night in 1858, Wade, Chandler, and Cameron, all anti-slavery, decided that they'd had enough of Southern insults and bullying. Outraged by the onslaught of abuse, they made a difficult decision. Swearing loyalty to one another, they vowed to challenge future offenders to duels and, as they put it, quote, fight to the coffin. There seemed to be no other way to stem the flow of Southern insults than to fight back, Southern style. Now, this was no easy choice. They fully expected to be ostracized back home. In the North, dueling was condemned as a barbaric Southern custom. But that punishment seemed no worse than the humiliation that they faced every day in Congress. So they made their plans known, and according to their statement, they had an impact. Quote, when it became known that some Northern senators were ready to fight for sufficient cause, the tone of Southern insults softened though the abuse went on. 
Now, the story is dramatic, but what affected me most when I first read it was the way the three men told it. Even years later, they could barely contain themselves. Quote, gross personal abuse had an impact on these men, and it was mighty. Not only did it threaten what they called their very manhood on a daily basis, but by silencing Northern congressmen, it deprived their constituents of their representative rights, which they called an unendurable outrage that made them frantic with rage and shame. To Wade, Chandler, and Cameron, sustained Southern bullying wasn't a mere matter of egos and parliamentary power plays. It struck at the heart of who they were as men and threatened the very essence of representative government. They had to do something, and they did. These men were doing their best to champion their cause and their constituents in trying times, and they said so in their statement. They had written it, they wrote, quote, for those who come after us to study, as an example of what it once cost to be in favor of liberty and to express such sentiments in the highest places of official life in the United States. They were pleading with posterity, with us, to understand how threatened they had felt how frightened they had been, how much it had taken for them to fight back, and thus how valuable was their cause. In a handful of paragraphs, they bore witness to the presence and power of congressional violence. When I first read their plea, it brought tears to my eyes. It was so immediate and yet so far away. It was also stunningly human, expressing anger and outrage and shame and fear and pride all in one. Not only did it bring the subject of this book to living, breathing life, but it showed how it felt to be part of it. By offering a glimpse of the emotional reality of their struggle, Wade, Chandler, and Cameron opened a window onto the lost world of congressional violence. And you can see why that document brought tears to my eyes. They literally said, we're writing this for posterity, and sitting there representing posterity, it was like, they're talking to me. Right? What a, what a, it was an amazing document to find. And you can see, given what I've just read in that document, why the late 1850s were the bloodiest years in congressional history. These congressmen were being elected and urged by their constituents to fight. So the field of blood doesn't tell a story of violent congressmen isolated in Washington. It's a story of a nation being torn in two with Americans cheering on their congressmen to fight. And I found one particularly dramatic example of this link between congressmen, congressional violence, and the public in an 1856 newspaper. That year, a Massachusetts congressman who was heading back to Washington from Massachusetts was met at the train station by a group of his constituents, and they had a gift that they handed him at the train station. They wanted him to take it back to Washington. It was a gun inscribed with the words, free speech, right? I can hear the noises you guys are making, which is the noise that I make every time I tell that story in my head, right? All the hair stands up on the back of my neck because it's powerful and, and shocking and blunt. These people wanted their congressmen to fight for their rights, and fight congressmen did. It's a dramatic story, and it's a story that the field of blood doesn't tell from on high. It gets down on the ground with congressmen and with the American public to recreate what it felt like to watch one's nation be torn in two. It explores how Americans came to turn on each other as enemies over time. To capture the intensity of this process of national reckoning, the book has a guide of sorts at its center. His name is Benjamin Brown French. A minor clerk in Congress he moved in congressional circles for decades, and he ended up being a real godsend to me because he kept a diary, an 11-volume diary, an amazing diary that's filled with his reflections and his thoughts and his feelings about Congress and with detailed accounts of a good many fights. He spent most of his time in the House watching. His job was to watch what was going on and record it. And so in his diary, he has these amazing accounts of violence, but he also literally writes about his sort of ongoing feelings about the nation, about Congress, about Southerners, about his party. It's an amazing, amazing diary. What's more amazing about it is, and this is yet another one of those things that I thought people will read about this person and think I made him up too, 
he's kind of like a Forrest Gump of 19th century politics. <laughs> because it's like, if something happens, something major happens on the national political stage, Benjamin Brown French is somehow always there. So someone tries to kill, tries to assassinate President Andrew Jackson, who is standing right nearby and sees it. Benjamin Brown French. Um, John Quincy Adams has a stroke. He goes back and serves in the House after his presidency. He has a stroke in the House. Who's by his side not long after holding his hand? Benjamin Brown French. Gettysburg Address. <laughs> Who wrote the hymn that was sung the day that Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address and was up on the platform standing beside Lincoln? Benjamin Brown French, and not only that, but you'll see in the book, I found a photograph documenting that, so I'm like, people will believe me now, because I have photographic evidence. <laughs> and then, of course, the, the, also yet another one of these historical and sadly unforgettable events, the night of Lincoln's assassination, who is at the bedside? Benjamin Brown French. So he's an amazing, amazing character who, who literally gave me the material and the essence and the emotion and the reality to be able to tell this story. So he was a great source of evidence, but more than that, he underwent a remarkably revealing transition over the years covered by the book. He came to Washington in 1833 as what would have been called a doe-faced Democrat, a Northern Democrat willing to do anything to appease the South and promote his party, and in his mind, I think, to save the Union. By the end of the book, he goes out to buy a gun in case he needs to shoot some Southerners. Now my thought was, if you follow this person over the course of the book, you will come to understand and ideally feel how he and many Americans learned to turn on each other. You'll see him at the beginning of the book fretting and desperately trying to do anything to please Southerners. As long as we don't talk about slavery, it's all gonna be okay. And by the end of the book, He's an anti-slavery Republican buying a gun in case he needs to shoot Southerners. I can't resist um, paraphrasing for you the diary entry where he goes to buy that gun because it's the most wonderful example of, in part, I suppose, the way that we live history in our everyday lives, but we don't always know that it's history that we're living. And in part, as doing historical research, sometimes you find the most amazing things, and they're, of course, bumping up right alongside the most everyday, boringly normal things, and this diary entry was an example of that. So he describes in his diary how he began to be nervous about the fact that Southerners were attacking Republicans in Washington. And so he says in his diary entry, I became so nervous that I went into town today and I bought a small pistol, the kind that I can keep on my person at all times, because I thought, well, if I'm gonna be attacked for my ideas, I'd better always be ready to fight. I also bought two pairs of underwear. <laughs> and I've a dollar a pair. And I've got a pair on now, and it's really comfortable. <laughs> well, of course, I just basically can't resist offering that quote whenever I talk about my book. But what's wonderful about it is that there's this striking moment of him going out to buy a gun to shoot fellow Americans right up against the fact that he had to buy some underwear that day too, and he has a pair on right now and they're comfortable. It, it creates the immediacy of that moment and, and also shows you how history unfolds step by step in everyday life. Now, 17 years ago when I began writing this book, I never could have imagined how relevant it might be when it appeared in print, truly. I'm an early American historian. I never imagined I'd be writing op-eds. So, this has been an interesting process, and I kept trying to finish it, thinking to myself, well, hey, there's a congressional election coming along. I'll get it done in time for that election. No, that happened a lot of times. And of course, it's impossible, given what I've just said, to entirely miss some of the modern echoes in the field of blood when you're thinking about current events. The book tells a story of extreme polarization, fundamental disagreements about what kind of nation the United States would be, splintering political parties, new technologies skewing and scattering the news and complicating politics in the process, conspiracy theories being spread. There's a whole chapter on conspiracy theories, North and South as the nation's crisis unfolds, panic about the impact of free speech 
in that fraught environment and rampant distrust in national political institutions as well as rampant distrust of Americans in each other. Now obviously all of that sounds somewhat familiar. I'm not saying that we're reliving the 1850s or that we're headed into a civil war. History doesn't repeat, but it teaches. And on that count, I think the field of blood has much to say to the present about the power and dangers of extreme polarization, about the importance of having trust and faith in national political institutions, about the dangerous power and persuasion of conspiracy theories to turn Americans against each other, about the importance of trust in our national system of government and of Americans in each other, and about the role of Congress, when Congress is fully functional, in creating and preserving what I call in the book a national we. The founding generation considered the study of history to be vital to protecting the American Republic. They assumed that only by understanding events of the past could Americans understand and recognize threats in the present. In that spirit, along with a desire on my part to show you some fascinating history filled with some good stories, some famous and not so famous people, and explaining in a different and new kind of a way some of the momentous events that shaped American history, I offer you the field of blood. I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I am happy to answer questions. We'll have a couple of microphones and we'll pass them around. Please raise your hand and we'll bring them to you. We have a question down in the front. How long did it take to mend the discord that you've described back in that period of time? How was it resolved? And does that have any lessons for us today? Okay. <laughs> well, it unfortunately was resolved with a civil war. Um, now, here's, but here's taking the historian long-term view of these kinds of moments of extreme polarization. There have been several, right? So um, the, 17, the late 1790s was a moment where Americans thought the political system was going to collapse and they were angry at each other and there was violence and extreme polarization and political parties splintering. The 1850s is another one of those moments. The 1960s, you could say, is another one of those moments. There are moments in American history where I think um, people understand that there's some kind of, if not one decision, that, that there are paths being debated in a really obvious way and people have very strong feelings about which path should be followed. Um, I think more often than not, one of the ways out of those moments is the political process. So it's like in 1800, an election, a presidential election, and people don't necessarily like the result, but they step back and say, okay, it was an election. The political process has kicked in. Let's see what happens. Um, or a Supreme Court decision, uh, or, or a piece of legislation. But, but in some way or another, very often, the political process, people abide by that process. That's essentially what makes us as a nation, is our, you know, the Constitution and however we choose to interpret and revise and amend it. So the process, I think, is a key way out. Obviously, we're in an interesting moment now where we're debating an election, and we're debating it in lots of different ways. So again, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it, it certainly teaches you things to notice and pay attention to and think about and think about the broader implications of them. And on this side. Hi, you mentioned that we're all walking through history. I love that. <laughs> um, you are also walking through history 30 years from now. What is from this time period, Ooh. if you were to write about it, what would you kind of zero in on? Wow, that's a question. <laughs> um, okay, well, as a historian, and as the kind of historian that I am, um, I would be most interested in the tone and tenor and nature and character of the way that politics is unfolding, how we talk about each other, um, how people speak about the political process, how they act. You know, I would be interested in the culture of this particular moment in time and trying to understand by looking at that how Americans of all kinds and not just political leaders 
are understanding what's unfolding and what that tells us about their assumptions about politics and what they expect and, and what might have gone differently depending on their expectations. So to me, you know, I think about this all the time because, you know, it's like every day there's some new thing that as a historian I'm like, what? And I think, wow, like all the dissertations that are going to be born <laughs> in the future by people looking at this historical moment. There are a lot of them. And there are endless ways in which people are going to be able to interpret what's going on now. But I think for me, a particularly interesting one would be to understand what it says about the character of American politics in this moment uh, and how we got to that point. Uh, I think personally, that's, that's what would interest me. We have a question in the middle of the house. In the introduction, it talked about you having an involvement in the Ten Dual Commandments. Could you speak to that? <laughs> yes. Um, and that's a good archival story, so I can even speak to that as a historian. Um, so uh, Lynn Miranda found my work on his own and, and read it and used it uh, when writing the musical, but I didn't know that necessarily. So um, the first time I went to see the play off-Broadway, I'm with a friend of mine who's a historian, and the play is going along, and they come to a song that's about the rules of dueling, and I get very excited because I write about dueling, right? And I'm like, yay, there's a song about the rules of dueling. I love this. And as the song is going, I turn to my friend, my historian friend, and I say, wow, that sure sounds a lot like chapter four of Affairs of Honor. <laughs> now, I then immediately thought, well, it's got to be Ron Chernow because he interviewed me about dueling and about the Burr-Hamilton duel when he was writing his biography. So I thought it must be me being translated through Ron Chernow. And I put it in the back of my mind. And as the song continues, uh, some of you might know the lyrics to it, but there's a line in it about how the doctor turned his back to the duel so he could have deniability. OK, that fact is from a document I found in the bottom of a box at the New York Historical Society. <laughs> and so when that lyric came out, I literally turned to my friend and said, that's my document. Like, I know that document. And that's where that fact came from. So when I then later got to meet Lynn Miranda and say to him, you know, that song, is that based on my book? And he said, yeah, of course it is. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> so I'm the historian who has a little tiny bit of my first book being sung on Broadway. But that, that's how that came to happen. And I have to say, the document, so there's a box of documents at the New York Historical Society about the Burr-Hamilton duel. Uh, and normally, you don't get served the box when you go there. You get served microfilm, because they're obviously preserving the documents. And on the day that I happened to be there, they couldn't find the microfilm, so they gave me the box. And on the bottom of the box is this document, and the duel happened in 1804, and the document's dated 1805. And it's very faded, so I'm sure that on the microfilm you can barely read it, which is, I think explains part of what happened. People get to it, the date's wrong, you can't read it, they move on. I read it, and it's the notes. So Aaron Burr's second, William Van Ness, was tried for his participation in the duel, and he took notes of his trial. And what I was reading were his notes, and he took notes of the people who testified, and they had the boatmen who rowed them across the river to Weehawken, and the doctor testified during the trial as to what they saw. So it was three eyewitness accounts of the Burr-Hamilton duel that, as far as I could tell, really hadn't been found before. And the doctor is the one who says, uh, you know, they ask him during the trial, what did you see? And he says, nothing. I had my back to the dueling ground. I, I heard two shots, but that's all I know. You know and I realized, oh, that's very effective. And there are all kinds of um, sort of customs like that, that that were revealed in the document. The guns were carried in a sack. So when someone asks these people, did you see du dueling pistols? Did you see guns? They're like, no, but people were carrying a bag around. So you can see all the ways in which these customs are kind of allowing them to circumvent the law. So that's, that's the story. of, and, and it's also a great historical archive story because I love doing research. So. In, in the back here. Thank you. Uh, Davy Crockett was a congressman for a term. Did he carry a Bowie knife onto the floor? And when he turned against President Jackson and, and Van Buren, did he get in fights? Ooh, good question. Um, I'm not aware if he did or didn't have a Bowie knife. It's really hard to find out who has weapons. Like I would, every stray example I would grab, 
Um, but people don't normally, sometimes people will say, I saw so-and-so with a knife, but people themselves don't normally confess that. I don't remember seeing anyone talk about that. I do remember people talking about the fact that he wore sort of normal congressional clothing except when people wanted to take a picture of him, a photograph, in which case he dressed in a sort of Western dud. So he certainly was paying attention to his reputation uh, as a, a particular kind of politician and, and hero. Um, I don't have, so of the 70 or so fights that I could document, and I should say I found a lot more of them, but if I couldn't absolutely prove it, I, I didn't allow myself to count it. I don't think I get, have one where, that, that involves him, which is interesting. It's a really good question. You would almost think you would expect that, but um, I don't re remember his name being among my list of, of congressional combatants. We have a question in the back. Uh, my question has to do with um, when, when the culture changed from this norm of having violence and weapons um, and, and to think about the role that women play being elected to office in terms of looking back 50 years at, to where we are now, what you think that change might look like moving forward? Sure. Um, so the first half of your question is, when does the culture change? So in a sense, not surprisingly, with secession, when Southerners leave Congress, the violence drops. And you get, like, like I found at one point, um, a New York Times editorial that said something along the lines of, um, isn't it nice to be able to walk the streets of Washington without having your hand on your gun? So, so there was a noticeable change. What's interesting then, and I talk about this a little bit in the epilogue, the book really goes up to the Civil War, but then the obvious question is the one you're asking, what happens when the Southerners come back? When they try to come back into the Union, there's an outburst, they bring back with them that same kind of fighting spirit, and there's a little bit of an outburst of fighting, but the dynamics are really different. Because now the North emerges from that war feeling that they have the upper hand and they can point to the Southerners as they do during the two or three fights that I found right after the war and say, well, look, the barbarians are back. Do we really want to let them back in the Union? So the fundamental dynamic is, is changed, is, is different. So that what before had clout and that they could kind of play up Afterwards, does obviously it has a very different impact. So you know, there's a, a fellow who is caned, violently caned, not in the Senate chamber, but in the halls of the Capitol um, by a Southerner, a Northerner, uh, and the cane shatters. He's caned until the cane shatters, just as the Sumner uh, Preston Brooks caning. There are people standing there alongside him, friends of the person doing the caning, holding guns to sort of back him up. With the Sumner caning, he had a friend standing there with another cane. So the similarities are really striking, but the response is so different. You, you get that Northerners essentially, you, you have some of them standing up in Congress and saying, think before you let these people back into the Union. That's a powerful message. Now as far as women, at the time, women had a mixed impact. Um, they were in the galleries, so when you were in Washington, men and women alike, uh, it was a very popular thing to go and sit in the galleries and watch congressional debates. Sometimes, before someone threw a punch on the floor of Congress, they would glance up at the gallery to see how many women were present, if there were women there, and sometimes they stopped. But on a couple of occasions with particularly quirky congressmen, before they threw an insult or threw a punch, they would actually look up to make sure that there were some women up there so that what they were doing would have more of an impact. Um, but increasingly, um, women certainly were present. There were eventually women reporters who were reporting. There's a, a woman, uh, Swisshelm is her last name, Julia Swisshelm, um, who her first day on the job, she gets admitted to the reporter's gallery. She's the first woman who's admitted to the reporter's gallery. And her first day there is the day when one senator pulls a gun on another senator by chance, and so she writes an account of it, and then she is, of course, immediately attacked as being an over-emotional female who is responding in the incorrect way to the fight, so that has a long dating back process, too. But I would say, overall, the, the sort of general assumption that having women present might have tamped down the violence a little is, is probably the direction I would go. A great example of that is during the Sumner caning. So um, Preston Brooks, when he's planning on caning Sumner, he comes into the Senate, he has his cane, he knows what he's gonna plan to do, he wants to walk up to that desk where 
Sumner is seated and say, you've insulted me, my kinsmen, my region of the country, and I have to basically take revenge. But when he walks into the Senate, there's a woman in the room. And he later describes how he sat down and very impatiently waited for her to leave the room before he came Sumner. And apparently, uh, someone else came up to him in that time, because uh, there's a lot of congressional testimony about what happened. Someone else came up to him during that time and said, um, you know, saw him watching this woman and said something like, she's rather attractive, isn't she? And Brooks said, yeah, she's very attractive. I wish she would leave. So he wasn't willing to do that in front of a woman, and she left the room, and then he did what he needed to do. So a little bit of a mixed message, but it mattered. It mattered and continues to matter. I mean, it'll be really interesting now, as the number of women in Congress grow, to see what impact that has on the culture of Congress, for sure. In the back on this side. Thanks. I just want to bring it back to um, when you were saying that you had to have faith in the political process. I was wondering how you feel about um, the voting and the attacks on voting and, you, you know, does your vote count and how all of a sudden no one can vote. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> um, and in a way, that's kind of what I was referring to. Um, before the election, uh, when asked, I was telling people, um, I'm very interested to see what happens with this election. Um, not necessarily the results as much as how the election is treated and, and how much validity it's given and whether people are willing to buy into the process. I don't know what's, you know, none of us knows on an hourly basis basically what's going on these days. Um, but it's, you know, I'm watching that very closely. Um, it might, you know, it's hard to know sometimes how much of what we're seeing is what happens during fraught political times and it's more of what we always see and how much is something new and different and I don't know. You know, as, as a historian, I do more looking back than I do looking forward, but I'm definitely watching very closely about what's happening and, and what the implications might be because it matters a lot. It matters a lot. It, 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 you know, it, it might be a moment, it, it might be more than that and I don't know. We have a question on the side of the house. Hi, I was really interested in what you said about the congressional record and how it was not actually that reliable. And I know that in current times, people have read things into the congressional record that did not actually happen in Congress. And so of course you based a lot of your research on letters and diaries, which we don't really have now. So how do you think historians are going to document this period if we can't rely on the congressional record and we basically are relying on, say, tweets? <laughs> oh, tweets. Um, so it's true that we don't have really private correspondence and diaries, um, but we have so many other things, right? We have, I mean, although my, I was about to say, we have videotape, but obviously that can be manipulated too, but still, we have new forms of evidence. We have more kinds of eyewitnesses. Um, and the record, although people read things into it, um, it is now more of an official document than random reporter guy who had to create something that was going to be seen as a record. There, was, there were multiple things that were considered, multiple publications considered the congressional record, and one leaned more one way politically and one leaned the other way. Nowadays, the record is a different thing entirely. It's a really good question. Uh, years ago, I worked at the Library of Congress, and I remember, and this was a long time ago, I remember there was a meeting in the manuscript division, and the meeting was essentially what are we collecting when it comes to congressmen, right? I mean, you can't even necessarily collect phone messages or emails, like wh what are we collecting? So it's a really good question. I always think, you know, as an early American historian, in a sense I have a limited amount of resources and a lot of my work involves digging and piecing. I always think if I were a 20th or 21st century historian, I don't know what I would do with all the evidence. It would be the opposite problem, would be sorting through it all and figuring, piecing together things so that you tried to figure out what was real versus what was fake. Different problem for a different time. And I think future historians will have to do what past historians have done, which is figure out the ins and outs of evaluating those, those kinds of sources. And as you're suggesting, there'll be some things that'll be harder to find and there'll be some things that you can find, you know, in a way that you can't before. So, for example, the, the author's note that contains that little passage that I read um, talks about 
uh, an Alaskan congressman who pulled a knife on John Boehner in the House of Representatives in the 1990s, which of course we didn't know about, or I didn't know about. It was revealed in an interview, I don't know, within the last two or three years, and surprised me because I was like, wait, you know, in the 19th century not knowing, but, but really, in the 1990s? And I, in the course of going online to you know, sort of make sure that that really happened, I found footage of that congressman twisting someone's arm when he was blocking his way into a conference room, right? So then I was like, okay, well now I have actual footage of a moment of you know, unpleasant personal <laughs> politics um, that clearly you know, I, there's nothing like that that would exist from the past. So you never know what new things will exist now that will lead people in directions that you can't go with past forms of evidence. And here in the back. So you said uh, history doesn't re repeat itself, but it informs the present. Um, your book sounds like a story of violence, um, but it's also a warning to the present. Um, what would you say, or do you have any concerns that people might draw the wrong conclusion and think because there's not violence today, therefore it, it's better. Yeah, um, I, I certainly get asked a lot, and, and I've been working on the book for so long that I've been asked it a lot. Um, people very much want me to say, um, well, it was much worse in the past, right? The, uh, now is nothing, it was much worse in the past. And then they want me to say, they'll say something like, well, in the past, you know, congressmen had weapons, and now it's much better. I, I don't think making that kind of comparison really fully makes sense. Um, I, I don't think better or worse, I mean, for some of the same reasons as I was talking about with evidence, right? These are very different times. So I can't, one of the first things I remember discovering, the first article I published as a grad student, and I put it out there and I thought it was clear and saying what I wanted to say and another historian came along and said, you know, it's really interesting when you say blah, blah, blah. And I thought, that's not what I meant. And then I realized kind of to my horror, oh my gosh, people can think whatever they want when they read what I've written. How terrifying is that? So I can't control that, but what I certainly can do, and despite my ending comments with this talk, what I have done in this book, you know, the book was conceptualized and written way before this moment. So it's not written deliberately or in any way asking people to make that kind of comparison. It's extremely grounded in a moment in time. I can't control what people do with that comparison, but what the book is really trying to do is bring to life that moment. And that's why Benjamin Brown French was so wonderful, because he's planted in that moment. He, he's kind of the guide that takes you through, and when you get to know him, you, you get to know his world so that I think you're not, as you're reading the book, necessarily seeing broad patterns that apply to all of time, you can read the book and then walk away from it and think about what it means. But the, the book is written really as a, a work that grounds you in that moment to really give you a sense of how this moment unfolded. And then I can't control the, the lessons people learn from understanding that moment. We have a question down in front. Uh, where were the sergeants at arms in all of this and were there any legal ramifications uh, after someone assaulted someone, did they go to jail? That's a, a good question. So where were the sergeant at arms? Um, they were there, uh, and supposedly what was supposed to happen, particularly in the house, so, so more of the physical fighting was in the house. There were a lot of dual challenges happening in the Senate, but the house was more crowded. It was crammed into a space that was not intended to have that many people in it. The nation grew very quickly. There were more states and more representatives, so it was kind of jam-packed. What was supposed to happen when there was a fight or a rumble was the sergeant-at-arms was supposed to rush into the melee with the mace, and the mace is supposed to calm people into respectful silence. You know, ooh, the mace, like we are in an official space. We should not be doing what we're doing. The mace never had that impact, as far as I can tell, ever. There was always a sergeant at arms. He would race in with the mace, and then congressmen would basically tell him to get out of the way because they were doing what they were doing, and they kind of didn't care. Um, sometimes, people, occasionally, people were brought up before the House. Um, very occasionally, they were reprimanded in some way. Um, Congress itself did not typically punish People, sometimes when people were reprimanded, they resigned and went home. But what's noteworthy is that very often, particularly Southern fighting men, uh, if they were reprimanded and they felt dishonored and they resigned and went home, they were typically reelected and put right back in because they were doing what their constituents wanted them to do. 
outside of Congress, occasionally there was some kind of a penalty, but even then, um, there's an incident that happened not long before the caning of Charles Sumner uh, in Washington in the Willard Hotel. There's a lot of fighting in the Willard Hotel. And in this case, uh, there was a, California, a Southern-born California congressman who demanded that breakfast be served after the hour when breakfast was served, and the waiter who got angry at the waiter who said, sir, we're past the hour, and ultimately pulled out a gun and killed him. And he's you know, brought to trial, and newspaper accounts of the trial describe him surrounded by congressmen and important people in Washington, and he's not punished. So you know, you're seeing the power of political elites as well in this period, and the assumption, you know, the United States was really violent in this period, and Congress was also representative. So you're also seeing an allowance for or tolerance of violence that nowadays we would think is off the charts that you know politics is inherently violent in this period and there's a lot going on that they took for granted that we would not take for granted. We have time for a couple more questions. One more in the back here. Thank you very much. When Cameron writes that document, he's taking a lot of flack in the northern press for his friendship with Jeff Davis and I'm wondering to what degree is this violence an attempt to impress the folks back home or to cement re-election or basically to do what the folks back home want you to do? Really good question. Um, well, so I would say first off, the document was actually totally confidential. They made three copies of it, one for each man, and buried it in their papers. And it says on the document, we're not writing this for anyone now to see it. We're burying it in our confidential papers. So as far as the document goes, it, it didn't have that intention. As far as their behavior, the, the, the statement, the, the memo, has a mixed message on that front. Because on the one hand, they're standing up for their constituents. They're fighting for their rights. They're not allowing the North to be silenced. They're doing all of these things that they feel they have to do. On the other hand, they say repeatedly in that document, we may be entirely ostracized for this. So I think they wouldn't have done it at all if they didn't think it had a good purpose and that there was a chance that, that politically this might have in multiple ways a positive kind of an impact. But I think they weren't entirely sure uh, what kind of an impact it would have. And when you look at, um, the history surrounding that document, there's, you know, they meet in, uh, the three of them go off and meet for hours trying to figure out if this is a smart thing to do or not. So I think it's a fraught moment and I think it's a complicated decision that you can't absolutely say they knew it would play well. I think they weren't sure how it would play. We have a question in the middle of the house. Hi, um, I was wondering how you might relate the violence in Congress, where maybe it's more acceptable to have weapons then and now in Congress it's not, but then going outside of Congress and looking at the American public and how much violence was going on. And for example, looking today, the violence that's going on in America, you know, all different places, with the inner city, Chicago where it's violent, or the mass shootings, and sort of that dichotomy between maybe Congress, they're not carrying those weapons, but outside they are. And is there a correlation between the violence that's happening outside, and maybe during those times too, and a war that might occur in a timing. So that was sort of kind of tying a few things together and uh, your thoughts. Well, I, speaking for the, the period that I've written about here, um, there's a really clear correlation between violence in the nation and violence in Congress. You know, and initially, you know, man-to-man -man violence. The North is plenty violent in this period, but they tend to riot in the North, whereas in the South there's a lot of man-to-man -man violence, and it's that man-to-man -man violence that ends up playing well to Southerners in Congress. But I make the point in the book that, you know, politics was inherently violent in this period. There was rioting and mobbing uh, at elections. There were people killed routinely during elections because of all the rioting and mobbing. Um, so there was a level of violence that would have seemed typical and that in some ways was representative. The people who were in Congress sometimes were the people who came from that background and sometimes they go home and continue to engage in that kind of behavior. So I do think, I think, you know, Congress is a representative institution in a lot of different ways. Um, and I, it's clearly it's intended to be politically representative. I think it's culturally representative too. As far as our current Congress, you know, I think there are a variety of different views as to what kind of culture we want in our current 
Congress and I suppose in our nation as well, I can't sort of have a pronouncement about what I think that correlation should be, but I think you're right to ask the question about how those things mesh and how the public is shaping what congressmen are doing and how congressmen are shaping what the public think of them. The book talks a lot about the role of the press in facilitating that relationship, right? In the book, I talk about congressmen playing to increasingly a, a nationalized press, the press taking sides and making up conspiracy theories and playing things in one way or another, the public responding and the public response being reflected in the press and then congressmen responding to that and, and it's like a, a vicious cycle that goes on in the book. You know, that's some of what goes on I think in any period and that clearly shapes the culture of a nation. So there's an important correlation but I think it's different at any given moment in time. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. The book is on sale in the lobby. We'll be doing a signing up at the front. Please give our presenter another big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending Chicago Humanities Festival. <laughs>